I think if I had realized this about 10 years ago, I'd be in a much, much better place now. I have learned a lot after 14 years of developing software professionally, including five years at a fan company. I'm confident that you will absolutely disagree with some of these things. I'm also confident that you'll be surprised by some of them, and I'm also cautiously optimistic that you'll agree with some of them. That said, I'm really hoping that lesson number 15 won't be about posting this video. It's better to rebuild something five times than to spend a month talking about how to build it. There's a famous story about a high school ceramics teacher who conducted a pottery contest, where one team of students was told that the criteria for winning was making the best quality pot, and the other team of students was told the winner would be the group that makes the most pots, irrespective of quality. The team focused on quality spent all their time carefully trying to make the perfect pot, while the second aimed to crank out as many pots as possible. In the end, the group focused on optimizing for quantity actually wound up making the pot of the highest quality, which was a byproduct of getting so much practice from making so many pots. Now, I have no idea if this test actually happened, but it seems plausible and the moral is very clear. Repetition and failure is the key to success, not extensive study. Personally, I think this concept applies directly to software development. It's far better to build something quickly, realize it's wrong, then rebuild it, than to sit in a conference room for weeks with everybody waving their hands around arguing about the best way to build something. Because even though you may throw away the first and second iteration of the project, you still retain the skill improvements you got from building them. And the third iteration is going to be far better than it would have been if you had decided on that approach before starting to write code. Feel gratitude when helping others. It's pretty much guaranteed that there will be times in your career when you are the subject matter expert on a system and someone else is trying to learn that system so they can be an effective contributor. Or maybe you've been assigned to mentor somebody that is completely new to the industry, so you have to teach them the basics. These people are gonna have a thousand questions and you're probably gonna have to take tons of time away from your own projects to help them out. In this situation, it's really easy to feel frustrated and become so concerned about the time displaced from your own projects that you become resentful. But the reality is, helping someone else is far more rewarding. You're in a position to establish rapport and trust with that person which has a cascading effect that can be far more valuable than the individual work you would have accomplished with that time. Conventional wisdom says the person being helped should feel gratitude, but I think the person doing the helping should feel just as much, if not more. Be proactive about getting the project you want. Getting a project you're not passionate about can lead to months of boredom and pain. What's even worse is that somebody else might have been passionate about your project, but got stuck with a project that they didn't like. If everybody is being silent about what they truly want to work on in an effort to not rock the boat, it can actually be a detriment to the whole organization. Of course, there will be times when you have to work on something you're not passionate about, maybe because nobody wanted to work on it and you drew the short stick, but there's no harm in being vocal about which projects you'd be passionate about working on. And do not accept that all the quote unquote cool projects will inevitably go to the more tenured engineers and that you just have to wait your turn. If you're in an organization that subscribes to this mindset, know that there are better options out there. Engineers that are passionate about what they're working on are a huge tailwind for the organization. Have a low tolerance for job dissatisfaction. It's really easy to talk yourself out of changing roles. Maybe you convince yourself that things aren't that bad or that you just need to work harder to get to a better place. Personally, when I look back on times I was dissatisfied with my job, I always talk myself out of making a change for way too long before actually making that change. The reality is that the job market for software developers is so hot that there's no reason to tolerate much dissatisfaction, and there's usually very little risk in making a change. Making changes can also help you distinguish between having skills that need improvement and situations where the expectations for a role might be unrealistic, because that distinction is really hard to make if you haven't worked in a few different roles. Prioritize your connections to coworkers over getting your work done faster. Obviously, there might be exceptions to this when you're putting out fires, but ultimately, investing in a better relationship with your coworkers is more valuable for the long term than getting that story or project completed a little bit faster. Establishing a good relationship with your coworkers not only makes coming into work more enjoyable, but it can also make design reviews and code reviews go much smoother when you have that pre-established foundation of trust to stand on. Treat your coworkers' code reviews as your own. As a code reviewer, there sometimes tends to be a massive unwarranted bias toward requesting changes instead of getting code pushed through faster. The code reviewer usually feels accountable for the quality of the code, but I've noticed they seldom feel accountability to the timeline for which that change is delivered, 
and often view timeline constraints as the author's problem, instead of one that they need to be cognizant of. Now obviously, if there are bugs in a code review, point them out. But if you're pointing out something that's less critical, just provide that context in your code review comment. You can say something like, this issue is minor, don't let it hold up the project, up to you whether you'd like to implement it. I think doing this can dramatically improve team cohesion without sacrificing any code quality. Make sure your coworkers feel heard. In design reviews or code reviews, your teammates might suggest approaches that you've already considered thoroughly and ruled out. It's really, really easy to get dismissive because in your mind, the approach they suggested is just so obviously wrong. But in reality, it might not actually be obvious. It just seems that way to you because you've spent so much time thinking about the problem. Make sure to highlight the merits of their ideas even if in the end, they don't make sense to implement. And to build on that, make sure you're open-minded enough to really truly consider their ideas. Sometimes it can be hard to truly honestly consider a new approach when you've been focused on what you think is the correct approach for so long. Either way, simple things like taking notes on feedback you get and sharing it after the meeting can go a long way in making your teammates feel heard. Don't eat alone. It can be tempting, especially for us introverts, to come up with excuses as to why we can't go get lunch with our coworkers. Maybe there's a looming deadline you need to hit, maybe you'd rather watch YouTube, or maybe socializing with people you don't know very well is uncomfortable for you. Set aside the discomfort or whatever it is and go eat lunch with them. In the long run, that rapport you establish with your coworkers will be far more valuable than whatever you'd otherwise be doing during that hour. Give Fang a try. We're talking about working for Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, or Google, ideally early in your career. I'm probably gonna get some heat for this one, but working for a fang company, or even just attempting to get a job at a fang company by studying for the interviews, can pay off massively, and not just in a monetary sense. Folks like to criticize the interview process, but personally, I felt like studying for fang interviews made me much better at problem solving, especially in situations where massive scale is involved. Now, there are really smart and motivated people at most companies, but it's really crazy how smart and motivated the average engineer at a fang company is. Almost everyone is really bright and extremely motivated, and there are very, very few exceptions. Being in that sort of environment can be really inspiring, in that being around those sorts of people and watching them excel can remind you that you're capable of much more than what you previously thought you were capable of. I think if I had realized this about 10 years ago, I'd be in a much, much better place now. Note that I said, give Fang a try, not work at a Fang for your entire career. Even if you don't wind up working for a Fang, I guess the broader takeaway here is to surround yourself with people that do a better job than you. If you're the most capable person at your company, you're probably gonna start thinking you're amazing, which will make you complacent, and you'll probably stop improving. If you do wind up working for a Fang company and you feel it's not a good long-term fit, don't feel like you're downgrading by going somewhere you feel is more interesting. Don't be afraid to take time off. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about using vacation time. I'm talking about literally quitting a job so that you can do something else for a while, whether that's something recreational or maybe to pursue a business idea. Of course, you need to have the savings to support doing this, but I feel like the lack of savings isn't always the thing that stops people from doing it. There's a completely irrational stigma around not having a nine to five job, namely that you'll be considered lazy, you'll lose your career momentum, or maybe that you won't be able to find another job because you have a gap in your resume. With respect to laziness, I think the folks thinking they need to miss out on doing something they love for the sake of their jobs are the ones that are being complacent. As for losing career momentum, I can't see that happening if you strive to continue to build your skills during your time off. And finding another job, at the time this video is being made, the job market is way too hot to be worried about that. I've literally never seen evidence that the gaps on my resume have been an issue. Plus, if you left your job on good terms, you can probably just get rehired there if you wanna be. Promotions don't come from programming skills. As an extremely introverted person that just wants to sit alone and write code most of the day, this was probably one of the most bitter pills I had to swallow. While it's true that you need to be a very proficient programmer to move up the career ladder, there's a bit of an upper bound in how far you need to go. In terms of career progression, there's a really steep diminishing return once you go beyond a certain skill level at coding. Once you get to a certain level, companies begin to value other things more, like interpersonal skills, the ability to debate others about high-level architecture, and getting groups of engineers to agree on the best way to do something. Getting better at these things can be much harder than getting better at coding, and many companies value them accordingly. Don't work on the weekend just for career advancement. 
Sure, if you're super passionate about what you're working on and it gives you immense joy, go ahead. And sometimes your projects might need a little extra throughput to meet a deadline. But don't do it just because you want to be perceived as a great performer. Most people will have a career that lasts around 40 years. There's plenty of time to achieve your career goals. And you can't just wait until your career ends to pursue everything else that you want in life. Maybe take that weekend trip instead of getting ahead on your projects. Make your career goals known to your manager. It's really easy to fall into the trap of feeling like talking about your next promotion will make you sound entitled, especially in the very beginning of your career. Psychologically, it's really hard to bring up promotion when at the same time, you're struggling to learn a team's systems, suffering from imposter syndrome, or maybe racing to fix some production issue. But the reality is that part of a manager's job is to see that you succeed in your career. And if they aren't bringing it up, you need to be. Discussing the gaps between where you are today and where you need to be to get that promotion is critical to staying on the right path. Without doing that, you can potentially be focused on the wrong thing and not even realize it. Technology decisions aren't always dependent on the use case. This one is really hard to implement, especially in bigger companies that obsess over data and metrics. I personally think that greenfield projects are the most exciting part of a software development career. And part of that excitement comes from the ability to choose the languages and frameworks that you're going to use. One of the biggest factors that usually plays into this decision is what your team and organization already use which might be what you and your teammates are most familiar with. Another factor is, of course, the technology that is deemed to be the best for the task at hand. It's this latter concept that I sometimes object to. Often when you're making these choices, you're usually not choosing between two completely different tools, like a hammer and a saw. Sometimes you're choosing between two different brands of hammer. It's really hard to objectively qualify why one brand of hammer is better than another. It really comes down to individual preference and which hammer makes you more inspired to get up and go hammer some nails in the morning. For example, the React and the Svelte JavaScript frameworks aim to fill almost the exact same need. It's usually pointless to argue whether React or Svelte is objectively better for project A. I think that I'm excited to try it, or I really enjoy working with it, is a good rationale for choosing a technology like this. As long as a sentiment is shared by the majority of the team and the community around the technology is relatively healthy. Now, of course, there are some broad technology decisions that are extremely dependent on the use case, like choosing between a SQL and NoSQL database. But after making that broader decision, Choosing the specific database starts to be more about what the team is excited about and enjoys working with than the use case itself. So that's 14 hard lessons I've learned in 14 years as a professional software developer. I'm really excited to learn hard lesson number 15. If you know what that should be, please let me know in the comments. Also, let me know what you thought of these 14 things. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.